Hello and welcome back to the Fearless Future Podcast. We're your hosts, Glenn. And Amber. And today we have a very, very exciting episode and something we've never done on a podcast or in public before. We're going to show you a spreadsheet to build your rental income without ever using any of your own money. I'm going to blow your mind away today showing you a spreadsheet and at the end of a very special gift to give you this same spreadsheet. But before we get started, to set the tone for today... We like to always have a couple of different fun segments that we do. So we're going to cover that today. We're going to do our stupid human comments. And we're also going to do our Gen X lost memories because i the one who usually walks in the room and forget what I'm doing every two seconds. So since most of our listeners are Gen Xers, I thought we would start to get us in the right tone of, of an awesome podcast. You okay? I'm going to quiz I'm, you today. I'm ready. Okay. So Bring t- it. Today, I'm going to play a movie clip, and we have to decide where it's from. you got to hear the whole way through. And mom, if you're listening to this, I apologize in advance. So hit it. (laughs) Yes, 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 yes. Oh, 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 God. Oh, I'll have what she's having. (laughs) <laughs> okay i don't think you even have to have seen the movie if you weren't really into tick flicks to know that scene i mean that is meg ryan in yeah. when harry met sally yes very good so great movie that you know i don't remember anything about that movie except for that scene that's of course all, not that's all that i remember she got pretty famous for that Do you know she was also in top gun did you know that yes yes she was in top gun and uh obviously one of my favorite movies of all time and so she run that same generation. She was Goose's uh, yeah. wife. Yeah, wife. Yeah, she sure was. So that's our uh, our our is Gen gooses, X. Is that right to say plural gooses? Goose geese <laughs> geese <laughs> geese yeah gooses. <laughs> so yeah, so that's our Gen X lost memory moment today, and I uh, hope you guys enjoyed that. As we get off to a good start, nothing wrong with starting the day with an orgasm. That's a great way to start, <laughs> Mom. Again, I'm very very sorry about that. So uh, listen, today I do want to dive in. We have a lot to cover and it's going to be a little bit technical in nature, but I think it's going to blow your mind when you hear what we have to say today. I am wearing glasses today that are readers, so it's a little blurry when I look out at you, but I'm going to be looking at the screen here in just a minute when I uh, when I help folks learn this. So before before we start that, actually, I'm going to ditch these for a second. Um, it's probably important to talk about inflation for a minute. Yeah, it, it's a big topic that's on everybody's mind right now because everybody's feeling it. I mean, I don't care how much money you have, like you notice how much gas is and groceries are. Groceries are insane right now. I mean, and and what it's like to go out to eat and try to go on vacation, like everything has just doubled in value, it seems like. I don't know if it's doubled in value. Doubling doubling cost, rather. Doubling cost. Yeah, Yeah, it's doubled in cost for sure. And there there is a a stat I want to bring up here and show you that I want to give you an idea that if the inflation rate is 3%, which I think last year was 4%. But let's just say it's at 3%. And so if you say to yourself, in 20 years, what is the dollar going to purchase if inflation continues at 3%, which I hope they can figure out how to slow it down because it's been horrible right now. 3, 3% per year over the next per 20 year. years. Yeah. 3% per year. So it compounds. Right. So 3% per year. There's a figure that you can use. You can go online to this website and you can Google it. It, just, it calculates. It says inflation, $100 at 3% after 20 years. Well, $100 what it buys today in 20 years, it's going to take $180.61. So, so almost double. 80% increase. 80% increase in 20 years. So think about what stuff costs now that's $100. You yeah. realize it's going to cost $180. Right. Or if it's $10, it's going to cost $18 now, right? Think about the difference in the amount of money there. It's crazy. Now I want you to think about I I use the same calculation and I put this in. I put in with the inflation rate of 4% over the next 20 years. At $100, if the inflation rate is, four, which is what it's currently been, 4%, yeah. I think we've even had some higher than that, but with 4% inflation, $100 today, in 20 years from now, it's $219.11. So call it, call it Almost 120%. 120% More than double. Increase. Yeah. Increase. So things that cost $10 today, what's some of the grocery that costs $10 today? That seems ridiculous already. I mean, if you buy organic eggs, they're like $8. So that's $8. The, so you're talking about those now being $20. Right. So a dozen eggs is going to be $20 in 20 years. And Insane. you might think, well, 20 years is a long ways away. You're going to blink your eyes. Yeah. You guys who are our age, Gen Xers, you know you blink your eyes and 20 years kind of goes by, right? Everybody's going to start having their own chickens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Well, you never know. Couldn't afford to buy the chicken or buy the feed. 
right? Everything, True. everything about it is expensive. So what else is something that's this 10, what's some of the $10 that you buy at the store? I mean, eggs, that's a great example, but yeah, I mean, you know, I don't really buy milk too much. I'm trying to think, um, think about what gas know, is now even, too. Even, even a loaf of bread, even a loaf of bread is six bucks. Yeah. So, so you're talking about that being $14 in 20 years. Yeah. So just that's some basic necessities in life. Now think about a car. Think about a house. Right. Right. Houses now that are three hundred thousand dollars. Talk about that same house in twenty years is going to be seven hundred thousand dollars with inflation. Right. Just think about that. Think about that. What that is. That, that's the, that's the cost insane. Of living. Yeah. yeah. And 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 wages aren't keeping up with it. They're not. Things are changing your I mean, so, Even in California, with the minimum wage being what it is, it's still not keeping up with inflation. You know, I can't not not getting political, but it's well, kind of a little political. But like when you say, "Well, we we're we work at McDonald's, we have to make twenty five dollars an hour." I don't understand what country you're from if you don't understand that if you raise minimum wage to twenty five dollars an hour, they're going to raise the cost of a cheeseburger and right. French fries and a soda. They're going to raise the price to cover the cost of right. the labor. So. So all that does is make things more expensive, which creates more inflation. Yeah. I, I get it. It's a vicious it. like, cycle. It's, a, it's not an ideal job. It's not, it was never meant to be a full-time career for people. It was meant to be a part-time thing for high schoolers or part-timers right. or work. That's what it was designed for, is to get people into the workforce. And some people choose to do a career and be a manager. Great. You can do that. But to make people that come out of high school get $25 an hour, my God, our babysitters- Get $25 an hour. That's insane to me. Yeah. But that's where the going rate is it for is. that. So think about that. So take take a babysitter. A babysitter in 20 years is going to cost people, if it if at 3%, you're talking about anywhere is between $45 to $50 an hour. Yeah. And if you think that's insane, I remember babysitting my nieces and nephews 30, 40, 40 years ago for $3. Yeah. And so it's doubled in 20 years, doubled again. And now it keeps up because it's been higher than 3% cumulatively, cumulatively over the past 40 years. Well, then we're going to go back to the Gen X era where our parents just leave us home alone. So, <laughs> Good. yeah. How how will you survive, right? How do you how do you? And here's here's the the best analogy I can think of when it comes to inflation is that you ever hear how to boil a frog? I know it's Why a weird. Why would you want to boil a frog? I don't really know. But if, but what they say is if you put a frog in warm water, he will sit there, and if you turn it up one degree an hour. One degree an hour, he will slowly get used to it. And eventually he will cook alive because he doesn't realize it's getting too hot for him because he gets acclimated to it. Think about what just happened to us during COVID. Prices went sky high and barely anything came back down to normal because yeah. what happened? People got used to it. Got used to it. They get acclimated to it. They get acclimated to it. They get used to it and they start to adjust their lifestyle. And then they get excited when it comes back down. It's like, because it, it raises so high yeah. and then and then the people bring it down a little or the government brings it down a little bit. They try. And then people are like, oh, okay, well, it's finally coming back but down. it's higher so than then, it was. Right. It's higher than it was initially, but people got acclimated to it and then they feel good about it because it's not as high as it was. So now you think about retirement. So you think about retirement because because for a lot of us, 20 years from now is going to be retirement. Right. If, you got, if you're a Gen Xer, like a lot of our followers are, you're in your 40s or 50s. And so you're starting to think that in 20 years, I'm looking at that retirement. Now I want you to think about how much things are going to cost in retirement. Yeah, you, yourself, you might think you have enough set aside right now because of the cost of living today, but look at that. Look right. at that illustration at what it's going to cost at 3% or 4% if inflation continues on this path, which and it probably will. If you don't think, well, it's always happened. Yeah. And, there, and there's no way the government gets smarter with getting into debt. Yeah. There's no way they get smarter. They just, it's, it's been a horrible cycle. They keep borrowing more money. They keep creating more, more inflation. They keep printing more money. All during COVID, they printed more free money. They have more free programs. There's all these, you know, even Social Security, they, that's, they, that's, that should go bankrupt here any year now. Right. So you, there's nothing to rely on for people that are looking. You have to start saying to yourself, how do I take care of myself? Yep. How do I take care of myself? And that's what, I really, what we really want to dive in and talk to you about today and, is how you can do and that. And because of where we are in life, if you are Gen Xer, we can't take advantage of compounding. Well, we don't have that anymore. We don't have that time. Right. That 30 years we should have used so or we 20 years we should have used. B. And it, I, I love this spreadsheet that you're about to go over. The, honestly, honey, this is like probably one of my favorite things you've ever put together. I, I think it it really paints you know, the I, picture. I did propose to you. That's something, right? That you shouldn't have. But I, put, I, I wrote a poem for that. Can we talk about that for a minute? That, that doesn't count. So. Okay. Let me say in business. <laughs> All right. I'll let take me, it. Let me classify I'll, this. I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Um, I think I've done a lot more better things than a spreadsheet. But. No, I, I just, I think it paints such a great picture and it's not like pie in the sky numbers. Like this is something people can actually yeah. 
plug into and figure out exactly what they need to do to reach their goals? Yes. So I, I want to dive into that today and I want to, it's going to, it's going to take a minute to go through that. But what I, what I first want to talk about is what we're talking about doing is called a self-directed retirement. A self-directed retirement is I'm not going to rely on the government. I'm not going to rely on my 401k. Uh, that whole 401k, that, that whole thing is a sham. That was built by banks for them to make a whole lot of money on fees. And you forget that as a, in a 401k situation, you have a partner. And your partner is going to take a third of that money as much as they can when you try and remove your money. Now, people say, but I can take it out penalty free. Yeah, penalty free before age 62, not tax free. Right. You have to pay tax every time you take the money out. I have one of our top investors. I love him. He's a great guy. And he, he bitches every time. He's like, I, it's terrible. If I want to take out $30,000, I get $20,000 roughly. Right. He has to pay taxes every time he takes it out. So really, how great of a deal is it if you have money that you take out, you're paying, you, you have a silent partner. So you think you have a million dollars in retirement. Hey, guess what? If you have a million, you got more like 650,000, mm -hmm. right? You don't have a million dollars in retirement. So you really have got to think about how am I going to take care of myself in retirement to recoup the inflation that's going to happen. If you, you stick your head in the sand and say, it shouldn't be that expensive. I'm going to vote for the right party. Bullshit. That's not going to work. Look Your over historically. Your mom's going to love this episode. We've had orgasms <laughs> and cussing. I'm sorry, mom. I do love you. But I want to make sure people understand. I get passionate about it because if you put your head in the sand, it's not like, you know, when I, I remember being in high school and gas was a dollar a gallon. Yeah. Now I remember being less than a dollar, actually. 99 cents. I remember that's about as low as I remember. How, how low did you ever see it? I think it was in the 90s. Yeah, like 97 so cents. Obviously very, like very, that, yeah. very cheap. Now, it's, again, different time. But I don't yeah. I didn't buy my own groceries back then. But I am sure my mom wasn't paying eight dollars oh, no. for organic eggs. Didn't even know what an organic egg was back then. But I'm sure that they were a couple they were probably bucks. all organic back then. It was probably a dollar, a <laughs> dollar, 52 bucks. It was, yeah, so look back to when you were younger. Look, 20, look, 10 years ago. Yeah. Hell, look, five years ago. Look what things cost. It's going to keep going up. If you shove your head in the sand, you are just going to get burned. Yep. You're going to be the frog that gets boiled alive. You'll be retired with nothing because you think you have money in your 401k, your pension, or you're counting on Social Security. That ain't going to help you. There's no way. And when you say the words self-directed retirement, like the emotion that comes up immediately for me is, oh, that sounds a little scary. Like if I'm being totally honest, that sounds a little scary because I don't know enough about that. Yeah. to to feel confident in making the right choices or the right decisions. So that that does like initially make me feel a little anxious, a little nervous. Yeah. But what I think you're going to show people here today, like you can't unlearn what you just learned and I think people have bought into things like 401k's or or different retirement plans because that's that's like the popular thing or the most common thing to do so that you just you just automatically give credit to it and think, okay, this is my best plan. Yeah. But when you are taught a different way, a, a more strategic and effective and profitable way, you can't unlearn that. And then I think that's going to ease that um, maybe fear or that anxiousness that comes from the self-directed retirement plan. Well, and and this, if anything, it yeah. should empower you. In this episode, I want to show you how you can very systematically, very boringly, is that a word? Boringly? Boring? Very boringly, I'm going to say it. Very boringly can buy a couple houses a year and retire a multimillionaire after the next 10 years of doing this. Very, very systematically and doing two houses a year. A year. And I'm going to show you how to do that without using any of your own money. So stay tuned. We're going to go through that in detail on a spreadsheet that I'm going to give you at the end if you stay tuned to the end. Before you do that, uh, I just I just had this thought. So you just made up that word boringly. And we were just in Orlando this weekend with our kids and we went to um, Wonderworks. It was this really cool, like it's an a upside lot of STEM down stuff. House. Yeah. Upside down house. Yeah. So I don't know if you saw it or not, but there was a there was a sign up that said um, talked about how many new words get introduced to the dictionary in in modern day. You know, things like cryptocurrency or and there was like a whole list of, of different words. And it said, usually, though, if, if those words are being created in our generation, we don't accept them as real words. We think of them as slang, but they do get into the dictionary as new words. Okay. The same is true of something like this. You know, this, is a, this might be a new introduction to you for a, a different strategy for retirement that might be a little bit hard to accept at first because it's not 
you know, maybe what your parents did. You know, yeah. it wasn't like common then. So I don't know. I just thought that was kind that's, of a, an interesting, interesting, no, interesting, it, interesting point interesting. that that sometimes we we might um, press against ideas because they're they're not from our youth or from you know what we were taught and raised right, with. Right. You know what time it is? I think I know. It's time for stupid human comments. I love this part. All right. So today, uh, dinosaur D. 7295 with a little dinosaur icon picture. I'm well, shocked give, about give that. Give some context I know, first. I was about to. So this comment was uh, about when we did the podcast uh, regarding women being better closers than men. So Dinosaur D said, women closers close more because there are so many simps that don't know how to say no. So is I'm that, assuming is simps is like simple-minded people simpleton or simpleton. People? Yeah, that, that's what I'm assuming that, that this person means. So women can't close unless the person they're talking to are dumb? Apparently. Is that what it means? They can only close dumb people? Yeah. Did you really say that in today's day and age? So, so OG Matt said, I was going to say this. Oh. Thanks, OG they Matt. support. Um, and then, okay, here's a good one. <laughs> L, this, this is from LGBTQRSTUVWTF. Okay. <laughs> and this person said, I came here to comment tits, but this will suffice. Laughing face. So what does that mean? So I can only close if I have tits. Well, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> hey, just, you know what? I'm just saying. <laughs> I think that no matter who you are, man or woman, you use what God gave you. You well. use what your strengths are. So, hey, if you can use your tits and, you know, hey, if you got it, flaunt it, whatever. Right, my mom is not going to like this episode. If she hears it, I'll tell you, I'm going to be, I'm going to get written up. I'm going to be, I'm going to be grounded. 55 years old, I'm going to be grounded. It's going to be terrible. But yeah, people say some dumb things on our comments. So uh, thank you for the uh, airing on the stupid human comment of the week. Nice, uh, nice job. All right, let's jump back into building a self-directed retirement with real estate. Now, I want to dive into this spreadsheet, but I want to give you some history. I built this spreadsheet about eight years ago. Well, let me define that. I hired a guy yeah. on Fiverr to build this spreadsheet because I'm not good at building spreadsheets. And it was it was a little bit complex. Yeah, it, 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 it went through a few iterations. It did. We, we had to say, okay, how much am I going to buy a house for? How much am I going to repair the house for? What's my interest rate going to be? I had to be able to change it because of different interest rate climates that I'm in. Um, what's going to cost me to do a refinance? How many years? What's my rent going to be? How much will the property appreciate? And from knowing those few, those few simple things, this will spit out a calculation to me that tells me how much I'll be worth if I do X, Y, Z every year. Now, I want to say this. The basic assumption of this is really, really important that we stick with the basic assumptions. And the basic assumption is we're going to, what we teach people to do is to buy an off market deal. So you're, you won't be putting money in, you'll be putting time in. Okay. And you're going to build all this without using any of your own money. If you choose to, if you want to earn money and do it that way, it's slower, but if you can use other people's money to build your retirement, that is true leverage. You're leveraging other people's money, OPM, to do this. And I want to use OPE or other people's experience. experience to do the work for you, including managing. This is without being a landlord. So if you have those, you mentioned before, like preconceived notions. Right. If you have a preconceived notion in your head, like, I'm not going to get a phone call at three in the morning because my toilet stopped up. I knew a guy that had that life and he hated it. Well, that guy did it wrong. Yes. That's how the old school landlords try to think they're saving money and they're not. They're wasting their life by fixing nonsense. We're going to talk to you quickly today about how to use a property management company to manage this portfolio that you're going to put together on an extremely part time basis. So the other assumption I want to say is this. This does not take into account rent increase. Now we know that rents will increase. I mean, look what rents are today. Look what they were 10 years ago and 20 years ago. Yeah. Dramatic different. And we've done other episodes talking about rents and all the difference in there. So understand that rents will increase, but so will property taxes. They won't, the taxes won't increase as much as rents will, but let's just say that those two things zero each other out for the purposes of this illustration. Okay. We can make, a spreadsheet that's crazy, confusing, crazy complex, but I didn't want to do that. I want to get a general idea because this won't be an exact science. 
I'm not going to pay 150 for every house. Some will be 120, some will be 180, some will be 60. Some will, there's all, it won't be an exact science, right. but generally speaking, this will get you in the range of knowing what you can be worth if you take consistent effort on an extremely part-time basis. And don't get so hung up on the numbers there because in different markets, the, the prices are going to be different. Well, but they can change it. They, right. That's what I mean. Don't get hung up on the numbers you're saying out gonna, loud because you can right. put your own numbers in the spreadsheet. We're going we're gonna to change it right here so I can show you how that all works. So that all being said, I built this spreadsheet because my parents, I remember being 1984, my parents paid off their mortgage. It was 30-year mortgage. And they paid off that mortgage and we took a motorcycle trip from upstate New York all the way to the top of Pikes Peak in Colorado. And they burned their mortgage. I was 14 years old, 14 or 15. And they burned their mortgage on the top of Pikes Peak. It was so high in altitude, you couldn't see the flame. <laughs> That's how high it was. It was, you know, whatever Pikes Peak is. I forget how many tens of thousands or feet yeah. or whatever. What, not tens of thousands, but whatever, a mile or two in the air. And... I remember that my parents having this discussion on that trip. You know, we, we, we were camping a lot during that trip. We, didn't, we weren't traveling in style. We were motorcycling and it was fun. But remember my parents talking about like that, their asset, their house was, let's say at the time was worth, you know, I don't know what it was, 1980, probably 70 grand. And right? what did they buy it for? Well, they, that's what I said. They bought it for $12,500. $12, and 30 years later, it was worth, let's call it 70,000. I'm, I'm taking a stab at that. I don't know what it was worth back in 1984. Now it's worth well over $200,000, right? They mm -hmm. still own the same house, but they paid $12,500 for the house. So that got me thinking, so wait a minute, properties are always getting worth more money or they are appreciating. Hmm. So as a young kid, I said to myself, so wait a minute, if I could get my hands on more than one house because when they retired that was the main asset they had my dad was a butcher mom was a mom became a nurse later in life not mm -hmm. until she was in her 40s but you know they drove bus and dad was a meat cutter at home we cut deer up for a living for people and it was it was you know it was, we we were pretty poor growing up great life and everything great great salt the earth people but not a lot of cash and i remember saying to myself if mom and dad retire and they have, a, you know, at the time when I was getting a little older, the house was getting close to $100,000 and they paid twelve dollars for it. I said, what if I had 10 of those? I'd be a millionaire. How do I get 10? And that led me to thinking about, hey, maybe I can get rentals. But how would that work? And I got thinking about, I don't know how to buy rentals. And then it came time to start putting, you know, have the rubber meet the road, as you say. And I realized that we can do this with other people's money and we can build an empire with that. So let's jump in the spreadsheet. If you're okay with that, and let me talk about it. Is that yeah. cool? You know, as, as you're saying that, as you're pulling up the spreadsheet here, I know I've said it on the other podcast, but it's worth repeating because it's a number, it's a, it's a stat that's always kind of made me have like that aha mm -hmm. moment. And it's that depending on the market, but in most markets, houses typically double in value every 10 to 15 years. And the 10 to 15 years are going to go by anyway. Mm -hmm. Don't you want to put your money somewhere that it's going to double? In 10 to 15 years. 100%. So let's take a look at what this looks like. So let's, let's, all the spots in yellow on this spreadsheet are spots that you can fill in. The rest of it are calculations. But where, what I really want you to see is this. You can take the house cost. Now, like Amber said before, if you say, well, Glenn, I can't find a house for 100 grand in my neighborhood. Well, fine, then put 200 grand, put 300 grand. Look at, you can, look at 300 grand. You can change whatever you want to change here. <laughs> I know that in my market, I'm going to want to find rentals that are about $100,000. So if, the, if you live in Southern California, you live in Las Vegas, you live in areas where it's not great to find those kind of deals, no problem. Find an area in the country, pr probably a red state that is landlord friendly, if you're going to build a rental portfolio, try to keep them all together in one area that will be helpful for you when it comes to property management and for liquidation later on down the road. But try and find an area where you can buy these. And these, there are, there are. And you're not looking on Zillow or Realtor.com to find no, these houses. These are no. off market deals. That's why you can get them for less expensive. Follow our other episodes. We talk about how to find motivated sellers, how to negotiate deals, right? All of that. What we teach our students is go find off market deals. Now, in this scenario, I want to go through this first so you understand the basic concept. Then I want to show you what it looks like if you do two a year four a year, six a year, and so on. I want you to show you what your retirement starts to look like. And, and you guys hear us sound a little exasperated when we say that. And the reason for that is because when we post these kind of numbers on Facebook or Instagram or whatever, 
we get tons of comments all the time of people saying, yeah, you can't buy houses that cheap in my area. And we've heard that comment so many times yeah, over and over and over. And yes, you can. Yeah. You just got to know where to look. You got to know where to look. And so if you can't find them in your area, that's because you're looking in the wrong spot. Yeah. No, it's it's literally like you go fishing and you're you're throwing your fishing pole in the middle of the woods and there's no water. You're like, I can't find any fish here. Well, no shit. You can't find any fish there. I mean, you're in the woods, right? You just you have to put your pole in the right pond to find fish. So let's dive in. So the house costs, let's assume for easy math that you start finding houses that are off market for $100,000. So these are houses that are a little bit disrepair. They're not horrible. They're not complete gut jobs, but you market and you find deals that are, you find a deal that you can buy for $100,000. Now you put $20,000 in repairs. Maybe it needs some cosmetic updates, maybe a little, you know, kitchen cabinets, paint, flooring. Well, let's talk about that. There's a lot of things in rental renovations that you don't need to do. If the roof has five years left on it, you may have to fix that in a full renovation. But in a rental, you don't have to. A tenant's not gonna pay more or less because the roof, it, it long as it doesn't leak, it's fine. Right. Make it a safe place, make it a clean, safe place to live. You don't have to replace all the windows, right? If they are older windows, but they have storms on them, or they're just outdated, but they still work, that's not something you're gonna have to replace for a rental. The kitchen cabinets, you can paint the kitchen cabinets instead of replacing all the kitchen cabinets, right? You can in, put, in some cases, yes. It, it, I, again, it's all going to depend on the... Generally yes. speaking. Yes. My, my point is, is it true? Is it a fair statement to say that you do not need to put nearly as much into a rental renovation as you do into a full renovation you're going to flip? In most cases, yes. So now I find a house for $100,000. I put $20,000 into repairs. So I'm in for $120,000. If you're following along on a screen, here you go. That house is now worth $180,000. So you have increased the value of that house. You've increased the value. You bought it for 100. It's now worth 180 because you put 20 grand into it. That's the whole idea is you're buying instant equity if you're buying it off market. Think of this as padding your retirement. If you're a Gen Xer and you're not prepared for retirement like you thought you'd be, this is how you catch up right here. You start buying equity because you're buying off market properties. Now, I want you to do a cash out refinance, meaning that I want you to, once you, oh, by the way, this money here, you're going to use a hard money lender. And one of the many other ways we teach on all of our other podcasts to do deals, but I don't want you to use any of your own money. You could even have lenders that do a hundred percent financing for all of this. And we teach all that in other courses, follow us on our YouTube channel, come to some of our seminars, whatever. We teach this all the time. So now you're going to use $120,000 from somebody else, other OPM, other people's money, to get this deal done. Let's just say it's a private lender for argument's sake. That lender is getting 10 or 12% in their money. They're thrilled. You use that money. You fix up the house. Now it's, now it's worth 180. You do a cash out refinance. Let's say that you, you pull out a loan of $125,000 in that property. So if you pull a loan out of 125, the banks will give you that, by the way, because you own the house. They're secured by an asset. So they're going to give you a loan of $125,000. Let's say you take it out for 20 years. And I hate putting this number in here, but it's true. Right now, I just called to get an eight unit refinance this morning and the rate is 7.5%. <clears throat> but it is what it is. You, you don't not buy property because interest rates are high. You buy properties now. And when the rates come down, you do a cash out refinance and you can actually get to a lower rate. You marry the property, you date the interest rate. That's what Jeff says, right? Yes. Yeah, you marry the property, you date the interest rate. That's a good one. So here we go. On this case, the loan rate is 7.5%, okay? Now, this is gonna make a minimum loan payment of $1,007 a month. I'm gonna say that your property, your property, and by the way, there, there are some caveats we have to work on through here, but- the, Oh, the, you have caveats now. I do, because there's I, I am doing this on the fly. I'm not taking a look at this like I probably should. So let me look here. If I take this, so this is saying right now that that payment is probably too high. So we're gonna, we may wanna look for a house that's worth more money. We can play with the numbers, but I want you to just, this is a general overview of how this works. Let's say the property appreciates at 4% a year, which we just said that's gonna double every 10 years, 12 years. So the property appreciates every four years, which we have seen double digit appreciation in many markets over the past few years in a year. But let's just say, generally speaking, it's 4% per year. Let's say the monthly rent you get is 1,900. I'm just curious if I change that to 22, because we're getting more like 2,200. Right. 
on our stuff. Yeah, our, our rents have gone up quite a bit in the last few years. Let, let's let's just let's say it's two thousand. Again, I, I want everybody to see that I can change this. When I change it, it changes all the numbers over here, right? This is going to annualize everything that we do. But with that being said, we don't want you doing eraser math. Like, don't don't like manipulate the numbers so you think they work. Actually, put in realistic numbers. Correct. I just noticed something I want to change. So this is this is how a spreadsheet works, right? I want to come back here and say, look at, I realize I'm taking out 120,000 when really, or, or whatever I had there, I want to I want to take out enough to pay off this investor. So realistically, it's 100 plus plus uh, 20 thousand dollars plus 5 thousand in interest costs and that kind of stuff. So this loan should be more like 125 thousand. Okay, Let, you know what? Here for the fun of it, let's say 130 thousand. So every fee is covered. Now everything's out of your pocket. Okay, so here we go. So now your your loan payment is 1047 for your for that. Now, let's say your property appreciation is 4%. We talked about that your monthly rent, let's just call it let's call it 2000. I'm, I'm gonna see I'm gonna try something here. If I do this at whoops, if I do this at 1900, I'm sorry, if I'm confusing you a little bit. But my point is you can play with this spreadsheet. Okay, let's say your rent is 1900. That's about the 1% rule, 1800 to 1900, right? That's about what you get 1% of the total value of the house is usually what you get for rent. Let's say it's 1900. Now, I want you to figure 8% for property management, meaning if you have multiple properties in one location, that's why it's good to have one location, you can probably negotiate property management to be 8%. It might be 10%, but let's assume it's, it's, it's 8%. Now, if you can only get 10%, you can change it. Boom, boom, that changes the numbers, right? If it's 10%. Again, I'm gonna come back over here, I'm gonna put 8% because that's what I pay. 5% for maintenance fee. So this is things, you know, if you have to mow the lawn between tenants or you have to keep up with some paint on the outside, whatever it might be, you know, some kind of maintenance fee, always kind of budget 5% for that. Figure that on a single family, 5% of the time, it'll be vacant, about 5% of the time. So about once every 20 months or so, it'll be, it'll be vacant for a month and you'll lose rent that month. Replacement budget for, you know, whatever that might be. It could be for a refrigerator, it could be for a dishwasher, a, a washer and dryer, it could be for some plumbing repairs or whatever it might be. But figure 3% per month that kind of gets earmarked in the account for those repairs. You will have them. And then your annual property tax. In New York, property taxes are expensive, 4,000. If you're in one of those red states though, you're probably gonna pay a lot more like, let's call it 25, let's call it 3,000, right? That's probably more like what you'll pay for taxes. Now, here's the fun part. I want you to ask yourself, could you do two houses a year? This, this is saying how many houses will you buy each month? So if you wanna buy a house this month, a house this month, a house this month, can you see all the numbers changing over here? If you wanna keep buying all these houses, you wanna buy 11 houses that month, that's a big number, right? So, that, so, so going from zero to buying that many houses in a year is, is a little aggressive. What if, what if we'd said, for the purposes of this, one a quarter? I, want, I don't even wanna say that. I wanna say two a year. Okay, so I want to say two well, a year. Well, that's weak. I think one a quarter. Just stick with me, would you, woman? <laughs> so this is two houses, a two houses a year. See this number down here? Two houses a year. Everybody with me on this? Okay, two houses a year. Now watch what happens. I want you to see this. In year one, you have two houses, right? Your your value of the portfolio is three hundred and sixty thousand dollars, but you owe two hundred and fifty three thousand. You took out two loans, right? Each house had a loan on it. But your annual rental income you're bringing in on those two houses is 18765 That's after all these expenses, okay? After all these expenses and after this mortgage payment. All right, so let's buy two houses in a year. And here we go. So here's what it looks like when you have a total of two houses per year. It's a house every six months. So it's a little bit of time effort from you. I would say you could probably buy a house realistically to start to finish 25 hours, 30 hours. Call it 50 hours. You think that's, if, if that, yeah. I mean, I'm, that's, I'm trying to be yeah. extreme, but let's yeah. say it's 50 hours to market, learn, hire a contractor. And again, once you get your team together, it starts going a little better. Yeah. But let's just true. say you're doing that. So you have 50 hours per house. So let's say you put 100, 100 hours a year in, eight hours a month. Right. Okay. Let's, let's make sure we're on that. Your portfolio value is 360000 Your debt is a quarter million dollars. Now, you have to get used to having debt because your debt is going to increase as you can, can you buy houses. But it's good debt. It's good debt. Yes, there's bad debt, good debt. That's a whole different conversation, which we don't have time for today. So year two, you have four houses. Year three, you have six. Year four, eight, 10, 12, four, get in the picture. I want you to stop at year 10. I don't want you to do anything else after year 10. After year 10, I don't want you to do anything. And the other thing I want you to do, in other words, I want you to stop buying houses. And the other thing I want you to do is, every time you make a few hundred dollars extra per house, 
or per month on a house, I want you to put it back in the portfolio. So take all the rent that you get, any positive cash flow that you get, you're going to pay down your mortgage and you're also going to put that extra money on your mortgage. Do you know what it does every time you pay an extra payment on a mortgage? Every If you, if you make an, an extra payment. A year. One extra payment of principal. To, no, total payment. Oh, total payment? Total payment. I thought it was principal. Total payment so, for the year because right, that, so, that extra money helps helps offset that. But it, it You takes, knock seven years yeah, off of about, your mortgage. About seven years, give or take, off of your mortgage. Depends on interest rates and a few other things. But it knocks off once. So I want you to put all that money towards the principal. Now, watch what happens. At the end of year 10, your portfolio value is $4.1 million. By buying two houses a year for 10 years, you now have $4 million in assets that are appreciating at 4% a year, okay? Your annual rental income is $288,000 a month. Your debt is $1.8 million, but you're going to roll all the income back into paying this off month after month after month after month. In year 18, you've now paid off this entire portfolio. And here's what it's worth in year 20. $6.2 million and your annual income, rental income, is $300,240 a year. That's about $25,000 a month in residual income. Is your 401k going to do that for you? I doubt it. I highly doubt it. Now. I want to have a little bit of fun with you on this. Now that you understand the basic, I hope I didn't confuse you to death. What if you added an extra house in here a year? And you say, Glenn, I want to buy one more house a year. I'm going to buy a house. Let's just say you want to buy a house every three months. Four months, right? Every four months. Watch what happens. I change the button and the same scenario happens. But guess what happens this time? You're paid off in year 18. And guess what? You own... 30 properties in this scenario, you own 30 total properties, you stop in year 10, but in year 20, actually in year 19, your portfolio is worth $8.7 million and your annual residual income from rent that a property manager sends you every month after all expenses is $450,000 a year, a year in rental income that comes in. Now you say, Glenn, I want to buy one house a quarter, like Amber said. I liked what Amber said because she's the boss in the family. Clearly, I want to do what she said. I want to buy a house a quarter. A house a quarter. Marry somebody ambitious. <laughs> yeah, I want to try, be prepared to <laughs> battle a lot too. So here, but it's worth it. Here we go. If you buy a house a quarter, you now will retire. And by, by the way, you're done in ten years. I want to keep stressing that you're done with the work in ten years. Now you're just maintaining the portfolio. With a, with a property manager doing it for you. The only phone calls we get is any repairs over $1,000. Under $1,000, it's all covered over here in these 5% and 3%, right? If it's a major repair, I say just fix it out of, the, out of the portfolio, just fix it. If it's a minor repair, take care of it. If it's major over 1,000, give me a call just so I can verify. I'll have to verify and have it be done, but it is what it is. Four houses a year, look at this. In year 18, this entire portfolio is paid off early, 18 years from today. So how old will you be? And your portfolio in year 19 is worth $11.6 million. And it pays you six hundred grand a year. $50,000 a month in retirement income. $50,000 a month in passive residual income. And you say, how is it passive? When you were younger or now, do you pay rent? Well, if you do, you're paying rent to somebody. Some company is owned by somebody. All of our tenants pay rent to a company. That money filters to somebody, filters to our family legacy, to our trust for our children. That's what it filters to. So you can do the same exact thing for you. It's an incredible way to build income. And none of this was done with any of your own money. Powerful. People forget that. This is an entire rental portfolio that was built without any of your own money. You used a hard money lender or a private lender that will teach you how to do to, to finance the initial purchase renovation. You went to a local, what's called a portfolio bank and did a cash out refi. They give you your money back. They give you up to 80% usually of the value is called LTV loan to value. Then you just have a management company come in, put a tenant, they send you a check. They, it's all automatic in our world. It's all automatic. The money goes into account, the rent payment comes or the mortgage payment comes out of the account. 
and it just spirals month after month after month. And you ignore it just like you currently probably ignore your 401k or you currently ignore your, your IRA. You might look at your stock returns once a year, once a quarter. You might glance at them and go, I don't know what's going on there, but I hope it's growing. Imagine this. And here's the cool part. Not only if you do one house a quarter, in 19 years are you making, clearing $600,000 a year in passive income, you have assets worth $11.6 million that you don't pay tax on unless you sell. And the beauty of real estate is you can actually take loans out against them and live on that money and let your tenants pay for your lifestyle. That's a whole different episode we'll talk about, but I just want to make sure you understand how powerful the income is as a real estate investor. If you choose to simply buy a few houses a year for 10 years and let it roll. You tell me where else you can go through and you know buy a house a quarter and essentially have something worth $12 million that still appreciates 4% a year, mind you. If you live another 20 years past that, that portfolio will be worth well over $20 million you'll leave to your family. That's a legacy, in my opinion. You can't unlearn this. Now you've seen it. You cannot unlearn it. You could pack it away and not do anything with it. But what are you going to do with this information? Yeah. Are you going to take action on it? It's not perfect, right? You're going to say, but Glenn, you've got to pay tax on the rental income. There's, I get it. There's lots of other nuances. If you want to make it confusing and complicated, great. It will never play out the exact way you want it to. Not every house I buy will be $100,000. Some will be 120, some will be 200, some will be 70, some will take repairs of 15, some will take 30. But generally speaking, understand the concept. I use someone else's money to buy an off-market property, so I buy instant equity. Then I do a cash out refi and take my money out, pay somebody else off, and let the tenant fuel my retirement from that day forward. There are four things I want to make sure you understand about this, and then I'm going to close out today. In a rental portfolio, there are four solid benefits to putting your retirement there. Number one, cash flow. If your cash coming in from rents is greater than all of your expenses going out, what you're left over with is called cash flow. You can spend it. I'm going to recommend that you put it back in to pay down your debt, but that's number one is cash flow. Number two, appreciation. Properties historically over 100 years have appreciated in value at least 4% a year. Some years a lot more than that. Some areas a lot more than that. But basically speaking, generally speaking, it will, it will continue to grow like my parents' house did. So your properties will appreciate in value, tax deferred or tax free until you sell it, until your portfolio sells it, right? That is what's happened. That sits there like an IRA getting worth more and more and more money. So that's cash flow and appreciation. You have depreciation, meaning that you get to take write-offs against your active income. If you flip a few houses or you have a job you want to have, you have a current job you do, you can reduce, maybe almost pay next to nothing or pay zero taxes because of the depreciation you can legally take because you're buying assets. The government allows you to depreciate against your active income. So that's more money in your pocket every single year. So now you have cash flow, appreciation, depreciation, and last and not least is debt reduction. Remember that your property is having the debt reduced because you're paying the mortgage every single month, but you're not paying it, are you? Your tenant is paying it through paying rent to you. So what happens is your property is appreciating in value. Let me try and do it on the microphone here. Your property is appreciating in value while your debt reduces every single month every single year. What happens when something appreciates and, and the debt is reduced by somebody else's money? This spot in here is how you get wealthy. If you ever wonder how you get wealthy buying single family houses, I just told you. If you don't do anything with it after this point, I can't help you. But if you do, I can help you. So dream for yourself. If you put one house a month on there, your head might explode to see just how much you'll be worth in 10 years. So. That concludes this episode of the Fearless Future Podcast. If you liked this episode and thought it was super valuable, make sure you click that like button and also subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss any of the great content coming out in the future. 